one or three, I think we're going to go. So I'd like to welcome you all to the Archer M. Huntington Award Ceremony, um, followed by the Sylvia Mani Horta Memorial Lecture. And of course, you all know that um, our friend, colleague, um, Sid Martin, former president, is the recipient of this award. So since the Renaissance numismatics has produced extraordinary scholars, while many are employed in museums and universities, a fair share of them have demanding professions outside numismatics. Most are collectors, but we also have famous dealer scholars. Often their extraordinary knowledge of numismatics is based on an intensive study of coins which they pursue with a passion and intensity that is rare in academic circles. Such amateur scholars have rarely formal academic training, which makes their achievements all the more remarkable. The man we're honoring today is one of those noteworthy individuals who has combined a highly successful business career and an academic output of the highest distinction. Sidney F. Martin is being awarded the Archer M. Huntington Medal, the highest honor that the field of scholarly numismatics has to offer. Sid Martin's chosen field of research and indeed collecting is colonial America. A fascinating period. The early American colonies lack money, specifically coinage, and small series are produced such as the well-known Massachusetts silver coinage the various uh, willow tree, oak tree, pine tree coins, and so on, or um, Hickley coppers. Then there are the various coins or tokens which were imported into America. And it is this area which Sid Martin has undertaken groundbreaking research. His four books, which all appeared at regular intervals between 2017 and 2018, offered dice studies of four of the big series, the Hibernia coinage, the Rosa Americana coinage, the Patrick coinage, and the French coinage for the American colonies. When reviewing Sid Martin's publications, the Huntington Committee was particularly impressed by the depth of research in these four monographs. There are models of how to do such numismatic studies. They incorporate detailed analysis of the dyes with research on the minting process, historical archival work, and outstanding historical analysis. As reviewers have pointed out, they will stand the test of time and remain indispensable for generations of researchers and collectors alike. Sid Martin has produced exemplary research, but the committee also recognized his engagement in the field of colonial numismatics, where he served for many years as editor of the C4 newsletter. In this capacity, he was able to assist many researchers in the colonial field. He also published important articles in the C4 newsletter, as well as other publications. His support for the field of numismatics, both as a hobby of collecting as well as an academic discipline, has helped in so many ways. Thanks to his research, he's built a bridge between European and US numismatists, and it is hoped that his research will encourage young researchers to expand on his work. Today, we're celebrating Sid Martin as an exceptional scholar and writer. He is, of course, much admired by his many collector friends and his fellow trustees at the American Numismatic Society, where he just stepped down as president after serving in this role since 2013. His contributions to the field are overall are truly outstanding. When I shall now sadly only virtually bestow on him the Archer and Huntington Medal on behalf of the trustees of the American Numismatic Society, he will be in distinguished company. 
In this field of American numismatics specifically, his name will stand along figures such as Sidney P. Noe, Eric Newman, John Adams, and we have Phil Mossman, I'm pleased to see, with us, to mention just a few of the great scholars. So it is a great honor now to award this medal, which is going to go uh, today by FedEx overnight to sit. Beautiful design um, by Emil Fuchs. And I'm just going to show you this. Thank you. And I now hand over to Sid. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining uh, me and our guests today uh, to, to, to celebrate numismatics in general. There are many, many people uh, who have worked with me, helped me, uh, gotten me to the point of this, this award. I, I thank the ANS for recognizing it. Uh, it was unanticipated uh, when they told me, it kind of blew my socks off, um, but I really appreciate it. There are many individual people to thank, uh, in, including those who've helped make this, this unusual presentation in these times of COVID possible. And that's Uda and Emma and Joanne and Gilles and, and Ben and just, just all the ANS people. They have been really tremendous to work with. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed it very much. I've enjoyed getting to know them over the last, well, at this point, it's been 15 years, I think. Um, they are a fine, fine group of individuals, and we are lucky to have them. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, coin collectors, the uh, Colonial Coin Collectors Club, who, who actually oversaw the publication of some of these uh, four books and uh, the help that they gave me. Most of all, I'd like to thank the, the, the whole community of numismatists. And that ranges from people that collect Lincoln pennies to people who collect those old silver things like, like Mary was just showing us. Um, it, 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 I, I'd like to say fraternity, but I guess I have to say fraternity slash sorority of, of numismatists have been a, 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 real, a real source of inspiration. Uh, they're great people. Uh, they're all willing to share. Uh, and, and I thank them for giving me at least 30 some years of pleasure and getting to know them and arguing with them and discovering things and figuring out who has a better coin. Is it by one point or two? It's, a, it's just fun. And, and I, I, I like that. Um, and again, thank you all. Uh, I, 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 I allowed some time at the end of the presentation, if you would like to, to ask questions, but uh, I would ask that you maybe hold those uh, until the end, or, or we could get in a, a back and forth that would go on till midnight. Um, and with that, I'm gonna see if I can bring up a presentation. All right. This is the title of my presentation. In the upper left corner, you will see George Washington with his comment on today's reality. Um, unfortunate, but, but true. In the upper right corner, you will see his personal book plate. Uh, if you collect Washingtoniana, uh, you will run into metals, uh, you'll run into uh, paper, uh, you'll run into all sorts of things that feature uh, some version of this uh, family crest. Uh, I, I thought that would be an interesting um, thing to show. Uh, in the lower right hand corner is a picture of Washington crossing the Delaware in December of 1776, um, done by Leachy and, and 
1853. Uh, the original was destroyed. There was one prior to 1853. This was a redone in 1853. It will be featured on many, many Washington medals, and in, in particular on those of 1932. And in the lower left corner is a fantasy scene that never actually happened, although it's of interest. The, the picture is entitled, George and Martha Washington inspect the first coins produced by the U.S. Mint. Uh, a, a nice thought. Uh, it probably happened in some manner, but not in the way shown in this picture. I, I really have three basic aims in this, uh, in this lecture. And to call it a lecture is probably overstating. It's more of a discussion. Uh, but, but my objectives are, I, I, I want to show how collecting even modern, relatively modern metals uh, can be both exciting and fun, uh, especially when you collect them topically. They're not going to break the bank mostly, and that's, that's kind of good. Um, a second, and maybe the primary objective, is going back to what Jerome said a few minutes ago, what, what was the reason for 1932, the bicentennial celebration? It is arguably the largest public celebration ever mounted within the United States and throughout the world on a single dedicated topic. Uh, it's incredible what was done. Uh, I find it interesting that not lots of people uh, remember it. If you walk down the street and say, hey, 1932, Washington Bicentennial, people will look at you and like, hmm, what are you talking about? But I'm going to show you, and, and maybe in, in too much depth, but I'm going to show you some of the uh, interest, the interest levels that were expressed in this, and, and, and just the, the outpouring of support for the celebration. And then I'd like to, to, as you must imagine, in a celebration of that size, it's going to have some numismatic output. It's going to have uh, things associated with it to commemorate the event itself. And I'd like to sort of delve into those. I find them very interesting. Um, I actually, Uda said I, I was interested in colonial coins. And it's true. I, I, originally started putting together my colonial collections by going out to flea markets and finding what I could at flea markets. And then all of a sudden it got A, too expensive, and B, I wasn't finding anything. So I decided I needed a fix whenever I went to a flea market. So I needed to find something in inexpensive. I found a couple of these 1932 Washington pieces and I said, you know, that, that, that might be interesting. So I bought them. I think they were $5 each. Uh, at this point in time, I now have well over a thousand categorized items uh, from this celebration, and I will discuss some of those during this uh, this talk. Okay. Uh, and this is basically what I just said. Um, the, the the numismatic aspects, the appreciation of the level. Uh, how, how modern metals can be exciting. Um, it's just, it, it really is. And the, the 1932 celebration didn't actually begin in 1932. It began in 1924. Uh, in 1924, uh, with separate resolutions, both the, both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate passed resolutions establishing the U.S. George Washington Bicentennial Commission. That was passed to the president, uh, Calvin Coolidge, in, in December of that year, and he signed it into law. So in 1924, the, the Bicentennial Commission was actually created. The chairman of the, of the committee was, in fact, the president of the United States, and it stayed that way throughout, uh, throughout the entire uh, tenure uh, until the, the, the celebration was closed in early 1933. Um, 
the, the, the members of the committee included the vice president, uh, selected congressmen, and well-known public figures. And these changed from time to time, but they were people like Henry Ford. Um, they got really heavily involved and, and, and caused things to come together. The, the action officer um, for this committee for its entire tenure really was a Saul Bloom who was a representative from the state of New York. And he really pushed hard on this. In 1930, the actor promotion of the celebration was begun and it was a coordinated effort uh, led by uh, Mr. Bloom. Uh, they contacted every city in town, every church, every school, every identifiable group, uh, every scout unit, uh, libraries. All of these were, were contacted. Uh, localities were asked to create subcommittees or committees of their own. In fact, every state ended up with a, a uh, bicentennial committee. Uh, they were encouraged to coordinate through the U.S. Bicentennial Commission their various activities. And it's astonishing what these activities were. I'd like to show you some of them. Um, the, the community programs given in towns, given in, in villages, you know, 127,000 of these were given just during 1932. Over 200,000 churches participated by giving programs honoring George Washington and his birthday. Uh, the, the patriotic and civil organizations joined in. Um, school units gave over almost 4 million programs at schools. Women's organizations, and, and for whatever reason, women's organizations embraced the 1932 celebration, including the refurbishment of, of Mount Vernon. Uh, they became very active in um, Arbor Day activities, which Washington had championed in his life, and, and, and so on. So it's not gonna be a quiz. You don't have to remember these numbers, but it's just astonishing what what was done, and, and I'm gonna continue that with the, the agricultural organizations. You say, well, what can a bunch of farmers do uh, to, to honor Washington? Well, they did all kinds of things. They had fairs, they had events, they had probably square dances and, and so on. The Boy and Girl Scouts became very heavily involved and, and participating, putting on plays, uh, studying, and, and so on. The, the, the next line, these 73,000 essay and oratorical contests, that got to be a really important part of the bicentennial. Um, at each state level, they sponsored these contests that began at the local levels and the, the, the winners at the local levels advanced to like section, advanced to like region, advanced to state. And, and the state winners uh, appeared in Washington, D.C., uh, where they gave oratorical um, presentations. Uh, 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 two, two awards were given, one for a male, one for a female. Uh, and it was well publicized. They got all kinds of publicity and, and so on. 30 million students were exposed to the bicentennial, to Washington, the father of his country. Now, I'm dating myself, but the picture here on the right, uh, the unfinished picture of Stuart, uh, Stuart's picture of Washington, that was printed by the, by the commission, the Bicentennial Commission, and placed in every single schoolroom in the United States. Uh, it was a picture about two feet by three feet approximately. And I may be dating myself, but I actually remember going to school and still seeing this picture. Um, in, in addition, the commission also uh, printed a, a, a picture of, of um, Washington's birthplace and provided that to each post office in the United States. I mentioned before that somehow 
trees had been, been extremely important to Washington. He loved them, he studied them, he planted them. Uh, and that was picked up by organizations throughout the country in, in, in terms of, of planting groves of trees, single trees, uh, during Arbor Day, during the whole year. And, and I'll show you as we go on some of the, um, some, some of the outputs of that. Coin stamps and medals by the US government. Uh, we're not gonna talk much about stamps, but the United States issued a series of definitive stamps, 12 of them, uh, beginning in 1932. Each had a unique portrait of Washington on it and uh, was used for up until 1938 as the definitive issues. The medals honoring him were made by not only the US government, but in just a huge number of private firms. And we'll talk about some of them. Uh, coins, uh, we'll get into in a little bit more detail, I think on the next two slides. Uh, Wakefield, as I said, the birthplace of Washington, it was restored uh, as was Mount Vernon during 1932. Washington Memorial Highway, the, the highway from Washington DC to Mount Vernon was completed in 1932 as part of the celebration. So was the Mor Mor Memorial Highway Bridge which connected the Memorial Highway to Washington DC and comes in right by the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, the National Masonic Temple was completed and dedicated in February of 1932. Okay, now th this begins to get into some more widespread. 17 countries sponsored George Washington Bicentennial activities. Uh, 233 cities in those countries. They named streets, parks, uh, they had squares named after him, they gave parades, uh, they gave uh, formal balls. Um, it was really, really something. As shown in the second bullet here, Turin, Italy named a bridge for him. Saigon erected a monument for him, as did Florence in Italy. Uh, gorgeous monuments. Uh, there were 22 pageants, 19 plays published by the commission and uh, an even larger number published privately. And, and I wanna point out that the numbers I've shown are those that were officially reported to the commission. They're probably guessing a third or a half of the actual number of events that occurred that were not recorded. Three songs were written specifically by, uh, for the Bicentennial Commission. And these are not exactly unknown composers. Um, John Philip Sousa uh, did the march, the, the George Washington Bicentennial March, the Song of Faith, and the Father of the Land We Love by, by uh, Cohen, uh, George Cohen. And if you were to go on the internet and search, these songs are still played. You can buy sheet music that was printed this year you can, you can listen to performances of the music. It is still an ongoing uh, process. Please don't read all this. I, I've said that the, the, the data I've, I've uh, shown came from um, government commission sources. There were five volumes published by the Bicentennial Commission. Uh, the first five shown here. There was a uh, news releases relating to the life and times of George Washington, a separate volume. And there were clip sheets and tear sheets published every, every month, uh, as well as pamphlets, Washington the Statesman, Washington the Farmer, Washington's religion, and so on. It, 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 in the aggregate, there's close to 5,000 pages printed. Uh, documenting what was done during the, the celebration itself. This is just one of the volumes that's, that's listed there. Now, I, I'm not pretending that I have done anything new. Uh, there was an interest in this uh, beginning uh, back in 1934. 
Um, Harvey Hansen, uh, writing in the Numismatist, documented some 70 medals that had been published um, or, or prepared for Washington uh, during 1932. Some of those, interestingly enough, first appeared in the uh, Numismatist uh, of the volumes and issues of that year of 1932. Um, in 1966, the basic research of Hansen was extended by uh, Melvin uh, Fulp. He added approximately 47 items um, and published it in TAMS. Uh, Joe Levine in 1979 did his update in the Numismatist, uh, adding about 22 items. In 1985, Russ Rulo and George Fold and just about everyone has a copy of their Bandalic Portraits of Washington. Uh, they added about 20. Now, there was an interesting thing in 1991 occurred. Uh, Jack Collins published a, a softback and a hardback fixed price list of selections from the collection of Boyd and, and uh, added about nine items that had not been published before. Now, an interesting thing here is that FCC Boyd was considered one of the premier collectors in American numismatics in the first half of the, the, the 20th century. Um, his collection was sold to John Ford. John Ford wasn't totally thrilled with Washingtoniana, so he contracted Jack Collins to put out this fixed price list. Uh, Jack was able to sell individually most of the items. The remaining items he consigned uh, to an auction gallery in, um, down in uh, Char Charles Kirtley, down in uh, North Carolina. Now, if you were going to collect Washingtonian in general and 1932 specifically, that is a book you need to have. It's not expensive. You can probably find it on, on AB Books right now. It comes up on eBay from time to time. That is just a must, must have book if you wanna research this area. Finally, in 2004, the most recent uh, attempt to update the list was undertaken by Paul Blanchard, uh, writing in Times. And he added about 32 items. Now, the, the number of items here is a little bit uh, confusing. Each of these authors developed their own reference system. Uh, they are not consistent. There are errors in each and sorting it out has, has not been uh, awfully easy. Um, so, some of the, sometimes a, 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 an item was listed as a single item, but could be found in three or four different metal uh, metals. Um, sometimes the, the writers consider that as one item, sometimes they considered it as three. Uh, so it, it's, not, it's not conclusive. Harvey Hansen actually used a metal designation that I'm not even positive I figured out what it is. He called it government metal. And as best I can tell by cross-correlating what I've collected to his government metal, I think what he means is yellow bronze. Um, in any case, this is the, 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 earlier, the, the, the bulk of earlier scholarship, although there was from time to time uh, in the numismatist and other publications, there would appear some uh, element of one or two metals, something on that order. Um, so I, I've kind of given you a background of what what happened in 1932, the level of interest. Uh, let, let's begin to get into the more numismatic aspects and, and discuss some of the coins and tokens and medals and, 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 and those sorts of things that, that were produced. I've actually grouped them into 16 areas. Uh, they're arbitrary. Uh, and I chose to show examples that portray the breadth of the imagery of Washington himself, 
that show the breadth of the shapes of the metals that were created, that show the, the metallic composition of these metals, that, that just give you a, a broad scope perspective of what these metals uh, or what these emissions actually, actually are. First are US Mint issues. In the upper right corner, we have a very rare uh, and quite an anomaly in the, in the Mint series. It's a muling. If you look at the, the coin on the left, you'll see it is the 1932 Washington Bicentennial piece. The coin on the right is the annual assay medal for 1931. So they actually took a 1931 assay medal and they combined it with a pattern for the 1932 Washington piece. The, the, the actual 1932 assay medal is shown here on the upper right. The only difference between this obverse and this obverse that's apparent is this obverse has the designer's name shown right here, Sinak. On this one, they took it off. Don't know why. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, we have uh, Laura Garden Fraser's creation that became the official medal of the commission. Uh, this medal was issued in platinum, one copy, went to the President of the United States, Chairman of the Commission. It was issued in two gold. One was given to each, the male and the female, uh, winner of the National Oratorical Contest. It was produced in silver, uh, about 2000. Um, the silver medals became first prize at the state level of the oratorical contests and um, were used for other special purposes and special awards. Now, why in the world do I show the Washington Quarter? The Washington Quarter was actually supposed to be a bicentennial piece. Um, I, here in a second, I can actually dig out the, the authorizing legislature. The, the Congress in, in the 4th of March, 1931, authorized a, a bicentennial commemorative coin to be issued in 1932 for Washington. It was originally conceived that the coin would be a 50 cent piece. And it was thought by the commission that what would happen is that they would turn to Laura Frazier and ask her to reproduce this design as a 50 cent uh, in a 50 Thank cent variety. Thank you very much. They're doing a lecture on US Mint issues, yeah? I'm sorry, someone is coming in. All right, so, Surprise, surprise, Congress stepped in to the treasurer and said, hey, you know, we don't really like that idea of, of making a half dollar and, and, and using uh, Laura's uh, design here. We, we wanna see you have an open competition among all the um, famous uh, sculptors in the United States. And we wanna see you make it as a quarter. And yes, we wanna see the 1932 quarter be considered the bicentennial celebration of US coinage. But we kind of think everyone's gonna like it better than the Liberty Standing Quarter. So just after 1932, keep making it. Now, everyone still thought that, that Laura Garden Frazier's design would be adopted in, in smaller format for the Washington Quarter. Not so. Uh, it was the favored design by the committee, but Andrew Mellon, who was then Secretary of the Treasury, stepped in and said, you know, I'm not real sure I want to see a woman design a coin for the United States. At least that's the reported story. So he chose the Flanagan design, which we still have with us, at least the obverse today. Then we have generic metals. These are metals that, that don't depict anything specific other than just, hey, let's celebrate the bicentennial. In the upper left, I, I, this medal was sold at the US Capitol. 
But I got to tell you, I, I, I'm not just sure who did the design of Washington, but I hope you didn't get a real high grade in art class. The medal in the upper right is clearly had been made to become a presentation piece with a, a, a tablet on the reverse that could be engraved for whatever the, the subject matter was. It could have been first prize at the fair or, or, or something of that nature. Uh, the lower left here is clearly designed to hang from some sort of a, a badge and could be used for generic purposes. That is also true for the coin or the token in the lower right. And, and on this one, I thought it was kind of interesting that the, the pattern of stars are totally wrong. <laughs> they got the right number, but they sure have them placed wrong. But again, look at the different representations of Washington himself. They go from the Houdan bust to, to third grade art to, to more, more refined. Fraternal organizations. <laughs> and the fraternal organizations, and just about every fraternal organization became involved uh, with, with designing medals and things of, of this sort. We have the Knights of Columbus here. We have the Ox Club here. We have the International Order of Odd Fellows here. And we have the Masons here. And these are only representative. They're probably three times this number of, of fraternal organizations. This is kind of an oddball. Uh, to save themselves money, they took this, this uh, eight-sided Washington piece and they planed off the reverse and they fused it to a existing Elks uh, metal. Now, it's not a one-off because I've seen about a dozen of these. Uh, and that took some, that, that, that's interesting. That's the only example of that particular type I've seen. But like, for example, here you've got the Washington National Memorial. Uh, you've got key, you know, Ben Franklin along with them. You've got, you, you just, you've got lots of representations of Washington. Clubs, all right. This is a club medal. It's actually presented for a 200 kilometer bicycle race but it was presented by the skating club. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. This is a well-known and, and very famous medal. It was published by the Detroit Coin Club. Uh, it comes in about eight different uh, metallic formats. It comes in silver, it comes in copper, it comes in brass, it comes in rubber, it comes, I think, one in paper, uh, and, and so on. Uh, very, very collectible pretty rare. Uh, here we have a, a more standard kind of uh, a rotary club issue. Um, and if you were to look in, in the, the, the Washington Medallic Portrait Book, you'd find that, that they had been unable to find one that was in any kind of condition. So in the picture in the book, these are effaced. Uh, they just don't show. And then finally, I, I chose to show the Stamp Club of Duluth, Minnesota. Now, if you remember, I said the, the U.S. published uh, stamps, definitive stamps in 1932. This is one of those stamps. This is the one cent stamp. It says basically the, the Washington Bicentennial. And it is, in fact, a pocket mirror. Uh, interesting. Good for tokens. These are tokens that could be exchanged for something of value. Uh, here is a clear example. You bring this coin in and you get a dollar off your suit. Um, I don't know how many were, were, were redeemed, but in 1932, a suit didn't cost all that much, 17 to $20. So it was significant. Uh, the one on the upper left was uh, Kelly, um, you had to you had to purchase uh, over twenty five dollars of of uh, material. Uh, it does not have the date nineteen thirty two, but Hansen, writing in nineteen thirty two, stated that he got this coin and it was used in nineteen thirty two. The lower left 
is, is Schwartz Fine Furniture. Uh, $5 off if you bought $50 worth of furniture. Well, in 1932, you could have probably furnished a house pretty much for $50. But still, $5 was $5, and it was the Depression. And this is another one out of Seattle that doesn't exactly say 1932, but was well documented in company records. And it was Grow a Diamond Plan. Uh, it said, T take this lucky coin and, and, and you, can, you can apply it to a diamond and you can grow the value of that diamond over time. Award medals. This one, it took me a while to figure out that it was Washington, but right there is George Washington. That happens to be Lincoln. This was presented by the, the city of New York, <coughs> I'm sorry, the New York Times, and it was a oratorical contest, but not of the life and times of Washington per se, but rather the Constitution of the United States. It's actually a quite beautiful medal. It's well done, at least in my opinion, um, and was presented to, to Leroy Kohler. Don't know the man. This was a academic key provided as a first place uh, for an oratorical contest held in Fresno, California. Um, here we have an honor essay medal presented by New York State for one of the winners of the essay contest. And over here we have a solid gold medal that was awarded by the Hearst Foundation for uh, essay contest. It's, it's 10 karat gold. There was an I, almost identical metal, well, almost identical in every way except it was silver, that was used as the second place award in that contest. Uh, and again, you can see that they are, they are awarded. It's kind of interesting. You can actually, if you get into it, you can begin to research these people as well. Merchant advertising tokens. Indian motorcycles, if you remember them. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Indian motorcycle clubs try to scarf up all these medals so they're not all that easy to find. Here we have the Northwestern Stamp Works. It's a uh, golden anniversary. Uh, clearly they were proud of it and they wanted to also capitalize on the bicentennial. Uh, the, the, the Dreamland Diner, quick service. Uh, Coney Island, uh, climbing right on the bandwagon. And then this is an example of a series of medals. And I don't know who the publisher was, but they were given out by a variety of ah, reasonably unusual uh, merchants. This particular one by the Flamingo in uh, Miami, uh, Miami Beach. Commission badges. These are some of the most beautiful uh, ammunitions from the, from the period. On, on the left, we have the commissioner from Illinois, uh, the George Washington uh, uh, committee, a bicentennial committee there. It's a multi-metallic. Uh, it's got a, a bronze center with a kind of a nichrome uh, surround. It has the map of Illinois suspended from it. Uh, actually a complex medal. On the, this medal is, I believe, one of the most beautiful medals issued by the, uh, the bicent by any bicentennial committee. It was issued by the Bicentennial Committee of Chicago. Uh, it is actually, um, actually manufactured by someone not known for making high quality metals. It is manufactured by Childs and Company. Uh, I'm sorry, by Green Duck and Company. And Green Duck is not normally thought of as producing really high quality metals. But look, this even has a hinge in it. You can't really see it, but it's three dimensional. The, the obverse bows out and the reverse bows in is, is uh, concave. Uh, very, very beautiful metal and, and quite rare. It was chosen to, as, as an example of what could be done back in those books I talked about with the 6,000 pages, talking about what had happened during the, 
during the bicentennial. This was chosen as a representative medal. Here we have a medal that was put out by the U.S. George Washington uh, Bicentennial Commission. Uh, there are actually three versions of this. The three reverses are slightly different. This is the rarest of the three. Um, they were presented to each member of Congress, both senators and representatives. Uh, they came in, in uh, gilt, they came in gold filled, and they came in bronze. I haven't seen enough or been able to figure out how they decided who got which. Uh, this, this particular medal went to uh, Carter Glass of Virginia. And oh, then the, on, the, on the right, we have a medal prepared by the Massachusetts Commission, given to Joseph Laguerre. It is, in fact, solid gold and uh, a, a, a good rendition of Wakefield, different from what, what you find on other medals, but a very similar obverse. Military. Uh, here we have a medal that was put out and was available to the public. During 1932 in Chicago at Soldiers Field, they had a military exercise where they literally uh, took folks through the, all, all the different military um, maneuvers and things of that sort. It, it's kind of a, uh, just a display of what we could do. Uh, it came in a couple different medals and was, as I said, um, presented or, or available to the public. The, the Richmond Light Infantry Blues, they came into being in 1798 and have continuously uh, been in existence. They have served in each of our wars. And this is uh, their presentation to current members. This medal is interesting. It, it shows the American Legion. The American Legion was created in 1918. So this was the 14th year of the uh, existence of the, the American Legion. And in fact, you'll find lots and lots and lots of American Legion medals, uh, badges uh, honoring Washington's bicentennial. One interesting thing about it is people don't really realize that in 1932, there was something called the Veterans March on Washington. 60,000 World War I veterans convened on Washington, D.C. to protest the fact that nothing was being done to support the veterans through the, uh, through the depression and in time of their need. So though I've never found published information, I think this medal goes back to that event. On the right, everyone will probably recognize the Purple Heart Award. The Purple Heart Award was originally established by George Washington in the Revolutionary War. It was given to soldiers of extraordinary uh, bravery and, and uh, service. There were only three or four awarded. They were cloth. They sewed them on their sleeve. Uh, in 1932, uh, the president decided to reissue or, or, or bring back the Purple Heart Medal to be awarded to veterans who had been wounded or killed in action. And it was backdated to World War I. Uh, as you know, these medals are still given today, but finding one with the 1932 provenance is really uh, desirable. Uh, Leonard McCann enlisted in the army in 1918 from Upper New York. He was sent to France. Uh, he served in the unit uh, facing the Germans. Uh, during an engagement, he volunteered to be a courier of communications between two adjacent um, echelons. And in making that run, he was uh, hit with artillery, uh, badly hurt, uh, evacuated, and, and then time passes. In 1932, uh, the Secretary of the War uh, directed that he be given a Purple Heart Medal. The Purple Heart Medal was actually awarded to him at his then current station in the Canal Zone in, in December of 1932. Uh, he left the military shortly thereafter, joined the Civi uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, and, and died shortly thereafter that. Uh, I was very proud to be able to find this medal with its just, just incredible provenance. 
medals issued by foreign authorities. The upper left, we have the uh, Lucien Bazar medal that was designed in France and, and produced by the French Mint. It's a beautiful medal, uh, extremely finely done. It exists in, a, a, in two or three different medals, uh, including gilt, which is this one, uh, including bronze. Uh, it has various appropriate edge markings. The medals was considered appropriate enough and beautiful enough that it actually became the, the medal awarded to the winner of the 1932 debate between France and the United States. Uh, and that is so, so noted on the edge. The, the upper right is a very busy medal, but if you look at it closely, it's a very beautiful medal. It was put out by the Masonic Lodge in the Philippines. You can see the uh, more indigenous uh, individuals being represented, uh, the complex shield showing the Masonic compass, uh, the, the bicentennial uh, designation. They prepared and, and minted 300 of these. It is believed that most were lost, <coughs> many in World War II. Uh, it is believed that only about eight of these exist at this point in time. I think there may be a few more, but, but eight is the number. The, the metal at the base is in porcelain. It was issued in Vienna. Uh, it was issued and sent to the United States. But there, there, there are actually two versions. They, they fell afoul of a, a, a U.S. law at the time. Um, it, the, the, the metal was produced by, and I'll probably pronounce this wrong, the Wiener Porzellan Fabric in Algarden, Vienna. Uh, Version one of this medal simply says Wien, Vienna. The second version has in English Vienna in uh, relief lettering at the base. They probably fell into the problem that things had to be labeled um, as to the country of origin and people didn't really know what Wien meant. The Republican National Convention, Convention was held in 1932. Um, they, they chose as their, for lack of a better term, their mos mascot, they chose George Washington. This badge was used at the convention <coughs> for official uh, business. Uh, this particular one is for the Assistant Sergeant of Arms. I have examples labeled telephone messenger, telephone operator, telegraph messenger, telegraph operator, usher, and messenger. And that's kind of interesting because it, it reflects the difference in what would happen then and what would happen now. I mean, they literally had people running all these different messages and messengers back and forth. Today, we have our cell phones. The uh, National Convention, the, 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 the delegates had a medal that looked like this. Now, this says alternate. The, the only difference between the alternate and the delegate was the color of the enamel as well as the wording. Uh, the, wording. The, the delegates had blue enamel. Now, the National Committee of the Republican Party awarded this medal to their, to their members. Uh, it's the only one I've ever seen that had a name bar on it, SX Ray. So I decided to try to see if I could find FX Ray. And there he is, compliments to the Library of Congress. Uh, he was, um, he was the publisher of the Watertown Public Opinion in South Dakota. Uh, he was a political pal of the very powerful Senator Peter Norbeck. And that's how I got to be on the committee. But I thought it was kind of neat to put a name and a face together and his medal. <laughs> Hark back to the fact I said there were lots and lots of interest in trees. These are, these are various badges or shields or whatever you want to call them that were given to be placed on trees that were planted. 
This is the most common and the cheapest of the, of the metals. This was a bit more substantive and, and larger. This one is really quite beautiful for, to go hammer into a tree. Um, it's very, very heavily convex, so it would fit right around the trunk. And then this metal was, uh, w w they, they planted some walnut trees at Mount Vernon, the scouts did, and this was their uh, plaque that they, they uh, placed in that, in that grove. Uh, this had a, a spike in it where they drill into the tree and then push it into the spike hole. A different kind of thing is lapel pins. There, I've located probably about a hundred different lapel pins um, that, that people would, would proudly wear during 1932 to, to show their support. Uh, this one came with blue enamel and red enamel. Uh, this one came in, in two different uh, styles. Um, the, the, uh, the plaque of this same design was adopted by the Bicentennial Commission as the official plaque. Uh, when that was done, they changed the wording on the back of this to the official portrait from the, the um, design portrait. Uh, this was a, a first award for uh, the contest award for the uh, out of, out of uh, Atlantic City, actually. Um, there's an identical medal in silver that was the second award. And so there are just lots of different versions. Th this has a back on the uh, a reverse that's much like a clip of a clip on uh, earring. Uh, it's Washington of Prayer at Valley Forge. Uh, an odd metal, not terribly attractive, made out of zinc. It had a button where you could button it through your, your coat hole. At the other end of the spectrum, this is a very simple metal. It had a tab on it. You just clipped it on your thing and folded the tab over. Um, some don't actually identify to Washington, but tell me that's not a Washington bicentennial piece with this chopping down of the cherry tree. And another, another version. Again, look at the, look at the different uh, profiles that were utilized. Plaques. Plaques were very uh, numerous, some very large. Uh, the upper right, oh, I'm sorry, the upper left is one that is in, encountered not infrequently. It's about, about 18 inches from one side to the other. Um, this one, which was a tree grove, was actually done by Bailey Banks and Biddle. Uh, it was a plaque that was commemorating the unfurling of the first national emblem. Interesting medal done by uh, Bela Janikowski, who was a noted Hungarian uh, sculptor. Comes in three sizes. This is a mid-size, uh, mid-size being about 160. Um, millimeters. Uh, it, it's very beautiful. The wooden encasement is just fabulously done. There's something interesting about this metal. I don't know if you can see, but between the letters of George Washington, there's a star between each letter, except on the very last, last letter where there is a sink foil. I don't know if that was an accident. His private signature or, or what the purpose of that was. I am most interested in this medal because it was done by Mako. And somewhere, somewhere in the, in the archives of the ANS are the dies from which this medal was made. It was made in about four different sizes, ranging from about three inches uh, vertically to about three feet vertically, and is, uh, is quite beautiful. Uh, Mostly interesting because it's a rifle and pistol association. This is a, is a steel rendition of the official Washington portrait of, of the Bicentennial Commission. Here we have macerated currency dated in the Bicentennial year. Talks about the fact how much money was in the macerated currency and so on. And then just a very beautiful plaque really 
uh, not attributed, uh, not signed, uh, but nevertheless, quite beautiful. Original packaging. It's challenging to find original packaging for these, these uh, items, but sometimes it's very important. For example, this bookmark uh, is marked on the reverse is sterling. That, that's all it says. There's no date. There's nothing else. But in finding the card that was originally issued on, you've got the proof that it was in fact a bicentennial piece. And that is also important because this little metal was used in bracelets, in jewelry, and other things of the same period. Uh, similarly, you wouldn't really know that this uh, China piece was uh, bicentennial unless you had the card of original issue. Uh, this, this particular one was in a, a, a felt pouch by the, uh, by the McDonald Bank. Uh, they, they bought the medals, it says McDonald Bank on the reverse of the medal, and they had them boxed up and given to their clients. Now, these are bizarre emissions, and I'm coming close to the end of all this, guys, so don't, don't, don't panic. I considered it sort of bizarre that the KKK would choose to honor George Washington on his bicentennial and make a, a, a big issue out of it. Um, this occurred right here in Philadelphia. So it's, it's just, to, to my way of thinking, it's bizarre. Uh, equally bizarre is, is this, and, and I challenge anyone to tell me what it is, and you, you can guess for a long time but it is a foil wrapper from a piece of chocolate candy made in 1932. It's the bicentennial dates. Uh, unfortunately, whoever had it ate the chocolate before I got it, but it was put out by the Rockwood, Rockwood and Company. Uh, and they made two versions of this with a common reverse, if this is the reverse, and slightly different obverses. This metal, which is about three inches, puzzled me for a long time. And I think I finally figured it out. I think it is in some ways an anachronism. I don't know if all of you have received the ANA magazine, the last one that was issued, but there was a fabulous article in there by Helena uh, Kagan talking about uh, the Bryan money and the elections in the period of the 1890s. Um, this was during the time when William Jennings Bryan was, was thou shalt not crucify five mankind on a cross of gro uh, gold. He was advocating for a 16 to 1 uh, exchange ratio between silver and gold. Uh, NIT stood for not in trust. Uh, and it's just th this piece from 1932 is almost a copy of what was done in 1896 except back then they didn't publish, they didn't show Washington. Um, what I've come up with is that this was a political comment on Roosevelt's expressed desire to demonetize gold. And it was a sort of a protest against that. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. This I consider bizarre for a couple reasons, 1932, and it shows the Republican elephant, it shows the Democratic uh, donkey. They're dancing on top of the United States. Both parties had political conventions, presidential conventions that year. Washington is shown on the, the reverse. 1932 is almost effaced. But what's interesting, it's an ashtray. The cigarette went right here. And, and you can tell that which side was used most because this one was obviously warm being face down. The cigarette went here, ashes went here. To further complicate matters, it was also a plaque. It had a hole drilled in it, so you could hammer it up on the wall once you were done with it or once you got tired of smoking, or whatever. So you have a, a plaque, cigar, political commentary, and too bad for Washington, he got, he got kind of worn. That's the end of my list of medals. Uh, as I say, that, that represents a very small portion 
of the ones that I've been able to locate. And I do hope that I've accomplished my purposes. I, I, I hope I've excited some people. It's certainly been fun for me. And I think if, I, I believe we're gonna have an opportunity for some questions if people would uh, really like to do that. I'm gonna close out the sharing and put us back into the Zoom presentation. Hey, Sid, this is uh, Peter Tampa. Yes, Peter. Uh, congratulations, first of all, on your award, well-deserved. No, uh, secondly, um, I was wondering if, if this uh, event was so popular because it was a diversion from the uh, hard realities of the Depression. I, that, that has been my theory for some, some time. Uh, it was a worldwide depression. Uh, people needed to have uh, some escape. Uh, you can see that in the fact that movie theaters, for example, thrived during the same period. Uh, it was very much a hard reality of life. But when the commission was established in 1924, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. So there was really uh, intense interest at, at the highest levels of seeing something um, done that would captivate the nation. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Mike Beal, AKA Jane McGill. Yes, are Jane, you, how are you? Are you, uh, are you aware of any efforts to um, initiate a similar event? It's only 12 years away. And do you plan to be on that committee? I hope you are. <laughs> I am unaware of such, a, such an effort. There was an effort put forth in 1982 for the semi-quincentennial of the birth of Washington, it resulted in perhaps, uh, I, I, and I'm only guessing, perhaps 50 to 100 different medals. It did not endanger, in, in, engender the, what, what we've seen in 1932. I, I, I rather doubt it. Uh, I hope it's not a comment on our, 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 our interest in history our interest in, in the founding fathers and, and so on. But, but, you know, 300 years, it's, it's hard to find people that, 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 that know about the bicentennial. So I, I'm not sure I see it. And would I be a member? Uh, well, if they drug me in kicking and screaming, maybe. Oh. But, but we will see. That was great, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Hey, Sid, uh, this is Peter. Congratulations on, on the uh, Huntington Award. I, I just want to draw your attention to a new book that I don't know if you've seen that just landed on my desk uh, two days ago. This is uh, George Washington on Coins and Currency, written by an Austrian uh, researcher named Heinz Schachler. Um, Heinz has actually written quite a bit of really interesting uh, uh, books and articles. In fact, he had a recent article in um, an ANS um, uh, or an AJN uh, issue and has done some work on paper currency. And I was just thumb thumbing through this earlier this uh, morning and it really looks like a fantastic book. So I'll, I'll yeah, send you uh, some information on it. So. Oh, okay, I actually have not seen it. I, I from a you know, brief description, I don't know if it dealt with metals or if it was just currency. Uh, well, it, it's mostly coins and currency, but it seems to also touch on all sorts of other things. Um, I will, so I'll, I will I'll enjoy getting information later. on that, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sid, have you, this is Mark Tomasco, have you seen very much done in security engraving since Washington was already on the dollar bill and appeared as the most engraved person probably in American history, um, QE2 being probably the most engraved figure in, in history in terms of banknote engraving. But have you run into uh, very much done for the 1932 celebration? Because I can't think of much. Pa paper money, no. Uh, yeah. Obviously, these, these I, I've cataloged the manufacturers of these metals, 1932 metals. There are now over 100 manufacturers. Each typically had their own engravers although they did borrow back and forth and lend each other. Um, the quality ranged from exceedingly poor uh, 
uh, almost amateurish to, to extremely good uh, from the engraving, in fact, excellent uh, for the engraving. Um, but I haven't seen that reflected in, in paper. I, the, the closest I can come is that um, Tanina Washington issued a series of, quote, paper money. It was actually wooden money that was rectangular in 1932 that featured George Washington. Um, it was not fine engraving, but it, it, at least it was quasi currency. But even in terms of engraved certificates or diplomas or any of that kind of thing, I can think of very little relating to the 1932 celebration. Uh, I, I found some, and it, it's been odd. I, I didn't include it in this presentation because it just didn't fit, but I found things like clothing labels uh, okay. that were multicolor, very, very beautiful actually. They were attached to clothing and said, this is prepared for the bicentennial. Uh, I've seen, I've seen um, lots of postcards that were in, engraved, uh, lots of ephemera of, of that general kind of nature, but, but not, not, not so much in, in, um, in, a, in a numismatic sense. Yeah. Congratulations on the Huntington Award. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Sid? Uh, yeah. John Kagan, congratulations. And, and, uh, I really enjoyed the lecture. Uh, I was fascinated by the, your reference to Congressman Saul Bloom. I, I didn't realize his connection. I think he represented the area I now live in, and there's a playground nearby. Uh, but uh, have you done any work on him? Because he sounds like a very interesting figure. Yeah, he was. He was extremely interesting. He he was the workhorse behind the commission, and there are dozens of letters that he signed. He maintained contact with. Most of these state organizations, he responded personally, at least he signed the letters personally, to people who would write in with questions. Uh, he then became very active after, after the 32 uh, bicentennial. He became very active in Congress, served in Congress until 1947, I believe it was, when he passed away, and was regarded as one of the, 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 the very powerful congressmen. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at his early background, uh, he was the impresario who, who kind of ran the midway at the uh, Chicago Columbian Expedi uh, Exposition in 1892 uh, and uh, uh, was a theater and music impresario before he got into politics. <laughs> we just need that type of talent if we're going to have a successful uh, tricentennial here. Yeah, well, he, uh, he certainly pulled off a, a, major, a major feat. And occasionally you'll see letters that he's written and things come up on one of the internet sites or something. And, and it's phenomenal the depth to which he was willing to go personally to, to ensure the success of the Bicentennial. Thanks. Hello, Sid, this is Howard Manners. Hi, Howard. Uh, if there's any representation of Washington's family, I particularly Martha Washington, I didn't see any of that. I, the answer is yes, but it's, it's relatively rare. Um, if you remember when I showed you the original packaging and I said there was this one China picture of Washington on a fob, uh, there were actually three fobs in that set. One was George Washington, one was Martha Washington, and one was the two of them uh, conjoined. Uh, I have also found uh, enameled pins of Martha Washington on cards that said Washington Bicentennial 1932. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only, I think, one or two metallic medals that I've seen that, that, that have Martha on it. And apart from that, I don't recall any, any reference to other family members, his brother or anything like that. Uh, Sid, it's Andrew, Andrew Burnett here. Um, yes. Well, that was an amazing collection of material and obviously being over here in uh, London, I was particularly intrigued by all the material from outside uh, the USA. So my question, my question is, what about Britain? Did anything happen here? Are we still too upset by the whole matter? <laughs> Actually, there, there are they're not 1932, but there are some medals honoring Washington nearly at that time. But 
they tend to honor his family in the in the the um, township or whatever. I'm not sure the right word where he was born, and and I guess it was Suffolk, and and um, you'll find medals representing his family going back in 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 England. Uh, I don't recall anything from 1932. You must mm. still have been upset. What can I tell you? Well, we still are very upset, but at least we can enjoy by reading your excellent books to help redress the balance a bit. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Sid. Uh, Jeff Shelton here. Hi, Jeff. Um, I also collect this series, so it's, it's nice to see a few I have not seen before. Um, so excellent collection, I, I must say. Um, in the first page in the Royal Fold uh, catalog, they have a letter from Saul Bloom that suggests that all the towns and, and everyone send them medals and copies for their permanent record. I was curious if you've ever followed up on that and if there is a trove sitting somewhere at the Smithsonian or something that has thousands of these in there, if you've ever done any of that in your research. Actually, no, but remember those, those five volumes that I, I, I told you about? Those five volumes include much of that correspondence and much of what was reported to him that had been done. And it was a compilation of that information that flowed into him that was used to produce the statistics I gave at the beginning of the, the speech. Um, really, get a hold of the five books. I mean, they'll break your arm trying to carry them all at one time, but, but they are really comprehensive in, in terms of what, how he related to local organizations, what he asked them for. For example, we talked about postage just very quickly. It turns out that there were over 1,500 postal caches recorded from 1932 that specifically honored Washington. Just a, an aside for you philatelists. Okay, thanks. Sid Ray Williams here. Do you plan to publish another book, your fifth book? Actually, the book is done. Um, will I publish it? It's unlikely to see the light of day. Uh, the reason is I did a research analysis, a market analysis, and I determined that the demand for my book was 12. And that was one for my wife, one for each of my four kids, and one for each of my seven grandkids. Uh, the book is 600 pages long. Um, I, you know, I've thought about, you know, print on demand and things like that. Uh, I, I talked to um, TAMS to see if they had an interest, and they had some interest, and I may follow up on that. But uh, it's, that, that's about where it sets, Ray. Okay, I'd, I'd hope a copy would be in the ANS library. Well, at the moment, the copy is in my house, and that's it. Okay, thank you, and congratulations. Thanks, Ray. I don't know whether we have any other questions, but um, I'd like to um, maybe close by thanking the Huntington Committee that does a lot of work, and um, its chairman, Jerry Backhog. I can't actually see whether he is uh, on this uh, panel, and Andrew Burnett, and... Uh, very grateful, but I um, also would like to thank in particular, um, congratulate uh, Sid's family in particular, um, his wife Sharon, who many of us have been on very many happy trips. And I know that anyone who is married to someone um, that collects as much, I'm speaking from personal experience, has to uh, suffer a certain amount, I would say. And uh, so Sharon, I think you deserve at least a small part of this medal when um, it gets to you. So I, I totally support that. So um, I'd like to, um, if there are no more questions, uh, congratulate again, Sid, on this uh, prestigious award. And um, I hope that uh, you, know, you enjoy when you get your medal. And we are all looking forward um, to whatever you can produce uh, next. You know, don't be so sure that nobody will read it. So. 
I thank you all um, for participating and um, I look forward to seeing many of you on one of our next talk. Maybe Emma can announce uh, when that is, but thank you for my end. And thank you again, Madam President. Congratulations. Right. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Congratulations again. Congratulations. Yay. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices.